Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Miguel Nebsch, and I am a member of the ESOT team. Today, we have a ESOT, ELITA, ILTS, and ESOL uh, webinar, a joint webinar that we hope you will find interesting and uh, learn a lot from. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, you are all muted as you come into the um, webinar. We will keep everybody muted, but there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end after the three panelists have delivered their uh, session or their, uh, their speech. Um, so there'll be about 20 minutes for Q&A, uh, and we hope that that'll be interactive and engaging, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. There are two ways to ask questions. You can press the button that has a little hand, as a raise your hand to ask a question. If that is the way to do it, then if you uh, if your question is selected and the um, the uh, chair will select your question from the list of questions that come up, uh, we will give you uh, the opportunity to actually speak into your uh, microphone and ask your question live. There is the other way to ask a question, which there is a questions section in the control panel. So if you prefer to ask a text question, you can do it through there. And we will alter alternate between the voice questions and the text questions. Uh, make sure that you know that your microphone is working if you're gonna ask an audio question so that we can do that as efficiently as possible. Also, if you have a, a text question, you can ask the question at any point. So at any point during the, the, in the interventions from the panelists, please do ask your questions through the text or raise your hand so we can select your question at the end of the session. So as you, as you uh, join us, we would love to um, hear where you are from, uh, where you're watching from. And you'll notice in the control panel, there's also a chat function. Uh, so we'd love it if you just would say hello, uh, greetings to the panelists and to the chair, and tell us where you're watching the webinar from, which city or country that you're watching from. We'd love to know uh, who's in the audience and where you're watching from. So if you'd like to contribute that in the chat section, We'd love to see that. Um, so without further ado, I see that there's quite a lot of people already joining. So I'm going to make the official start of the webinar. I hope everybody's understood the housekeeping side of things. So welcome once again to the Liver Transportation and COVID-19 uh, webinar, a joint ESOT, Elite, ILTS, and ESOL uh, webinar. Uh, and this is a larger project that the host will um, speak a little bit more about. And this is a COVID 19 webinar series supported by an unrestricted uh, grant from Casey, as you can see in this slide. So we're very thankful to Casey for that. And I'd like to introduce our chair for today, uh, Wojtek Polak, Surgical Director of the Liver Transplant Program at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam and Chair of the Elita and the ESOT section, the, sorry, Chair of Elita, the ESOT section focusing on liver and intestine transplantation. In the past few months, Elita has developed a comprehensive project on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on liver transplantation in Europe. The results of this project will be among the main topics of today's webinar, but I will let Wojtek introduce the program and our speakers. Over to you, Wojtek. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining uh, this webinar. Today, uh, we launch an important collaboration between uh, ESOT, Elita, uh, ILTS, and ESOL, these three societies have joined forces to study the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on uh, liver transplantation worldwide. As the next step in our collaboration, may I have a next slide? We will run a survey to collect the data on liver transplant candidates to better understand the impact of COVID-19 in our patients. We will send uh, this survey soon to all liver transplant centers worldwide. Next slide, please. This webinar is also uh, the part of preparatory activities for uh, Transplant Liver Journey 2.0 uh, work stream on COVID-19, which is led by uh, ESOT President Vasilos Papalois. The TRG will take place online, and we invite you to join the, the discussion on the ESOT Transplant Live. We would like to uh, also acknowledge Merck uh, for supporting the TRJ work stream on COVID-19. Uh, after this short introduction, I would like to uh, immediately move to our program, and I would like to introduce first our three excellent speakers. 
So uh, we have uh, um, first speaker is Dr. Luca uh, Belli uh, from Italy, director of liver unit at Niguara Hospital in Milan. He's also a LITA board member and he serves as a LITA treasurer. The second speaker is uh, Jean Amont from United States, a professor of surgery and chief of transplantation services at Columbia University and the New York Presbyterian Hospital. And finally, the third speaker is Karine Lacombe from France, a director of the Department of Infectious Diseases at Saint Antoine Hospital Sorbonne, and she is also the member of the ESOL Education Committee. So today we have three topics on liver transplantation related to COVID-19, and I would like to start with uh, Luca, my colleague and friend uh, from the Elite Award. He will talk about COVID-19 in liver transplant recipients data from the uh, ELITA ELTR registry. Uh, Luca, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wojtek. So good, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and perhaps good morning for someone. So it's a pleasure for me to uh, show you over the next 10 minutes the uh, data, the final results of the ELITA ELTR registry, which collects quite a substantial number of liver transplant recipients with COVID-19, around 250 cases. I have no disclosure, and I will be happy to share the details of this presentation. So just a few background information, just to remind all of us that the world is still in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. We've more than 12 million cases reported worldwide and more than 500,000 deaths. And all liver, all, all transplant patients are potentially vulnerable to SARS-CoV-2 infection and this complication likely due to the presence of comorbidities, which are highly prevalent in this patient population. Due to the aging of this population, many of these patients were transplanted uh, 10, more than 10, 15 years ago, where when they were already in their 50s or 60s, and likely due there is a role played by the immunosuppression. And more specifically, the liver transplant recipients represent one of the largest immunosuppressed cohort in Europe, with more than 98,000 alive patients registered in the ELTR registry. And of them, 22,000 are nowadays in their 60s and more than 1,000 in their 70s or older. What is known to date on the upper part of the slide, the sources, so the paper, the publication, reporting in the literature, we know that the prevalence of COVID-19 is uh, around 0.5%, not far different, not much different from what observed in the general population. Mortality rate has been reported between 10 and 20%. Again, not much different from the general population, balanced at least for age and gender. While for the role of comorbidities and of immunosuppression, the role is very likely, but the, uh, the, the prior publication lacked the power to demonstrate this strong association. And as for symptoms, there is perhaps a higher, there is perhaps there is certainly a higher prevalence of abdominal symptoms and more specifically diarrhea, which is uh, twice, three times more frequent than in the general population. What is needed? All authors reinforce that greater case numbers are urgently required to accurately improve our understanding of individual risk, and it is the reason why. Elite ELTR implemented such a registry. This would, of course, allow a better prognostication and guide follow up and monitoring for the more fragile patients. Just a few words about the survey, which has just been mentioned by Vitek. It was very useful. It was launched in mid March this year. It was very useful because, among other things, it allowed us to get an idea of the impact of COVID-19 in liver transplant recipients, in particular the expected numbers of patients that would be included in the registry. I remind you that the, the ELTR, there are 149 centers affiliated to LTR, almost two thirds of them uh, 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 reply to the call 
with 56 centers having observed at least uh, one single case. And in this respect, I remind you that the pandemic hit very severely uh, many European countries, but in a very scattered way. And for instance, in Italy, there were three regions in another part of the country that were severely hit, but luckily the rest of the country was uh, virtually spared. And this explains why only 36 uh, uh, centers uh, uh, actively participated uh, uh, with, uh, with the registry. So let's move to the registry now. So the, uh, we have 254 COVID-19 cases in adult liver transplant recipients. 11 cases were asymptomatic cases and they were captured as a result of the surveillance protocol for those contact with uh, uh, positive subjects and these asymptomatic cases were excluded from the analysis. So in the end, we will deal with 243 COVID-19 symptomatic cases in liver transplant recipients, adult liver transplant recipients. 39 cases, the less severe, once were treated as outpatients, while 204 required hospitalization. Just a few words about the clinical presentation and course, the symptoms not different from the general population. We confirm a higher prevalence of diarrhea, and this is probably possibly connected to the use of specific, is favored by the use of specific immunosuppressant, specifically MMF, and we have, uh, we have a, a subcourt in this uh, uh, um, registry of patients maintained on MMF alone, and the prevalence of diarrhea in this subgroup of patients was really very high, around 50%. A substantial percentage of patients had uh, uh, radiological findings of interstitial pneumonitis with a typical ground glass opacity, and all these patients required some sort of oxidative support in terms of uh, oxygen supplementation, uh, low flow through the nose or non-invasive ventilation, 11% of the patients and 25 patients required admission to uh, the mechanical ventilation and admission to the ICU. But let's move rapidly through the results. This is the uh, most relevant, unfortunately, endpoint, which is, of course, mortality. We had uh, 49 deaths in our cohort and all these deaths were observed in patients who were hospitalized, no deaths luckily in those who were treated at home. And this accounts for an overall mortality of around 20.1% and in hospital mortality of 24%. Uh, the same information is here provided from the other side of the coin, that, that is the survival. The Kaplan-Meier analysis stratified by site of patient management. And as you can see here, the survival for those patients who uh, required admission uh, in the ICU, 35 cases, uh, the survival was uh, really bad. 50% uh, survival uh, after 50 days. But the main objective of, this, uh, of the registry was the search of potential predictors of uh, of mortality, of outcome anyway. I apologize for this quite busy slide. And to this aim, we uh, perform a, a multivariable Cox regression analysis. And as you should see from this table, there were quite a number of variables highlighted in red that were significantly associated with mortality, named age of the recipient, both linear and categorical, age of the transplant, the presence of diabetes, the number of comorbidities, and the use of specific main immunosuppressant. And all these variables were included in a multivariable models, and only two remain uh, independently uh, associated with uh, mortality, namely uh, age of the recipient with a patient uh, older than 70, doing much better, and the uh, use of specific immunosuppressant, namely uh, tacrolimus as main immunosuppressant versus cyclosporin or mTOR with patient on tac tacrolimus doing better. We were a little bit surprised not to see uh, uh, comorbidities, which are highly prevalent in this patient population, but we were also aware that the 
uh, the number of comorbidity uh, increased with the uh, age of the recipient. So it was uh, suspected that the dominant effect of age could mask the effect of comorbidities. This is why we constructed a second model where removed age from, uh, from the model. And this allowed diabetes and chronic kidney disease uh, to emerge as an independent predictor for, uh, uh, for mortality. And once again, also in this model, it is very relevant, uh, uh, tacrolimus was confirmed to be protective. Just, uh, I conclude with two figures that will show you the effect of age on survival. And as you see here, recipient aged uh, uh, older than 70, the red line, they did much worse in comparison to younger patients. And the final slide that will show you the interplay of some uh, cofactors, namely the use of FK and a chronic kidney disease, the, in the most favorable combination were patients on tacrolimus without chronic, liver, uh, chronic kidney disease. They have a, a, a very favorable survival, while the worst combination are patients not on FK, but on cyclosporine rather than mTOR and uh, with uh, uh, renal uh, problems, and this patient did much worse. So I move rapidly to, through the conclusions. So, so overall, early mortality, uh, the median uh, observation time was 60 days, was around 20% and increased to 24% in hospitalized patients, peaking at 52% for those requiring ICU. Abdominal symptoms were confirmed to be uh, quite frequent than in the general population, uh, possibly favored by the use of specific immunosuppressant, namely MMF. Age, uh, patient older than 70 and the use of cyclosporin or, M or mTOR emerged as independent risk factors for mortality. And comorbidities, in particular diabetes and chronic renal failure, were also relevant predictors of mortality, but their role was shadowed by the dominant effect of, uh, of age. And of course, uh, I need to conclude with this uh, very important slide that this study could not be done without the contribution all, of all the following investigators. So on behalf of Elite LTR, thank you to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Luca. Fantastic talk. And uh, again, thank you for putting so much effort in this study uh, on behalf of the Lita. Um, due to the time uh, uh, schedule, I would like to move immediately to uh, uh, next talk. Uh, and the next speaker is Jean Mont, uh, who will talk about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the liver transplant candidates in the United States. So we move from Europe to the United States. Uh, Jean Mont, please. Thank you very much. Uh, the uh, introduction was excellent, and the medical observations are very practical, and I will not uh, cover that. I'm more interested in the logistics of our experience. I have no conflict of interest. SARS-CoV-2 worldwide pandemic has disrupted healthcare since January. We are in the midst of a rapid progression across the United States, and you have heard about the impact on transplantation patients. We had a terrible experience in New York, uh, which uh, peaked in the pandemic. We have just in the city of 8 million people, a quarter million uh, confirmed with 10% overall mortality. We have neighborhoods in New York City with up to 60 or 70% prevalence of antibody exposure. In the United States as a whole, we have 134,000 deaths out of 3 million cases, but many of our states uh, that did not institute precautions are experiencing uh, increasing numbers. 
in our hospital, we saw our hospital system, we saw 12,000 total patients with a total mortality of 18%. And in my hospital, we had 2,700 patients with a total mortality of about 22%. At the peak of our experience, we had almost 2,500 patients in the hospital with 7, 000, uh, 750 patients on ventilators, a doubling of our capacity. So at the peak, which came at the uh, first two weeks of April, initially we were unprepared, we were not masking, we had inadequate testing, a shortage of PPE, and in the first two weeks of the pandemic in March, we had multiple staff members infected. Once we developed uh, full precautions, uh, very few uh, clinical staff became infected. At the peak, our hospital was 85% COVID patients uh, using the intensive care units, no elective surgery, and only limited transplant activity of hearts, lungs, and livers. Our total population of transplant patients alive and under care was 9,000 patients, and we had trouble getting a hold of them to know if they were uh, still okay. During the initial time, our um, our state collected overall data just in New York State, uh, and we identified 1,000 transplant patients who became infected with COVID, the majority kidneys, second was livers, and so forth. The mortality was uh, highest, actually, in the kidney and the lung patients. In our experience, our first case in the city was on March 1st. Uh, we had our first uh, uh, solid organ transplant patient two weeks later, and overall, 270 of our transplant patients of all organs uh, became positive. The peak occurred sometime in this time when we had six to seven new patients a day. We put a near total hold on transplant for, except for the most urgent patients and stopped kidney transplantation. We reported our first 90 patients with the clinical syndrome uh, and analyzed them. And our overall experience was similar to what you heard from Luca with a mortality rate of approximately 25%. In conclusion, our observations is that uh, transplant patients have a similar presentation to the general population with a high level of morbidity and mortality, but our testing limits uh, mean we're uncertain about the, um, the total uh, denominator of exposure, many secondary complications, and we uh, were interested in learning from Luca that uh, tacrolimus is a favorable uh, baseline. In terms of the impact of transplant volume during the period of the pandemic, well, the first six months of the year, we had a 25% reduction in renal transplant, which really was confined to the second quarter uh, of the year compared to the uh, 2019. In Illinois, we had a comparable reduction. In Florida, there was no reduction, although it's coming now because Florida is getting its peak late, just like Texas. And California has stayed largely stable. You can see though that the uh, liver transplant volume remained active even through the worst of the pandemic. So the, in summary, we had stable transplant activity 
until we reach the critical tipping point of the overwhelmed health system. Our experience was that mortality was less than we feared in both the transplant and the waitlist population, and probably comparable to the uh, population at large. And of course, immunocompetence, viral responses, and optimal immunosuppression remain unresolved. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jean, uh, for this uh, very interesting talk, uh, experience from the United States. Um, and uh, we are moving to the uh, last talk, uh, and it will be given by Karin Lacombe, uh, how medical societies reshape their educational offer during the COVID-19 pandemic. So now we are moving to an education. Karin, the floor is yours. Yes, hello, everybody. So can I have the next slide? Okay, so here are my conflicts of interest. Next slide. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and then you can definitely share the details of my presentation on Twitter, and you've got my Twitter account here. Next slide, please. Okay, so first of all, I would like to to share with you the challenges in the field of education through this SWOT analysis. So what, what were the strengths of education proposals before the COVID-19? Was well, a prior quite rich education offer and the weaknesses were that during the COVID uh, epidemic, uh, there was an abrupt cancelling of face-to-face -face meetings and workshops. And for example, I'm talking about ESOL, which is the, the, the society uh, who I work with regarding the offer in education. We had to cancel uh, our annual meeting held in April. What are now the opportunities? Well, uh, it, that we thought that it was a great time to implement new modes of education based on the never-ending resources of the web, like today, for example, where through this webinar, we can gather quite easily throughout Europe. And what are now the threats? Well, that's limited access to education when it's limited, when there is a limited access to the web and especially for the patient-oriented um, education. Next slide. So how did we overcome those challenges? First of all, I would like to share with you the ESOL campus, which is the ESOL's learning hub, where uh, we have implemented a lot of educational contents, and I will, I will go through some of them with you, so you can share your knowledge and, and easily find uh, online resources to enhance your knowledge about hepatitis and hepatology. And for example, on the ESOL's learning hub, uh, we, which is called ESOL Campus, and you see here uh, the, web, the web link. Uh, in June 2020, we had more than 5,600 registered users and, and uh, more than 53,000 connections. Um, so what is the content of this learning hub, uh, ESOL Campus? First of all, there are online courses and we have designed quizzes to test your guidelines knowledge the ESOL promoted guidelines, but also all other uh, kind of guidelines related to hepatology uh, in Europe and even uh, in America. And there are also webcasts and webinars, and we'll go through some of them a little bit um, later. And you can also find Congress materials like e-posters, et cetera, from the former, the prior ESOL conferences. And finally, uh, you can also uh, go through slides decks that you can download and use for, for your own purpose. Next slide, please. So here are the latest developments of the ESOL campus. Uh, the webcast series on COVID-19, and we held a live webinar um, conducted by ESOL and WHO, and we have also recorded this webinar. We'll tell you a little bit uh, later about that, and also a Q&A uh, session, which has addressed and published in a, flip, uh, in a flipping book. And you have here some pictures of what we've done with the webcast and, and, the, and the, the webinar uh, from ESOL and WHO. Next slide. And for example, uh, this ESOL WHO webinar uh, was, a, uh, was a great illustration of how uh, we have been able to partner uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic with the World Health Organization. It 
has been held in May, uh, in May the 14th, and uh, it's now embedded in the player of Fusel Campus with, Q, with a Q&A function. And you can see here uh, the, the link, the web link, where you can access uh, this uh, webinar, which has been recorded. And this webinar has been held with 11 faculty from all over Europe, and also um, Asia and Africa with Egypt, for example. And uh, this is a 90 minute program where you can find a lot of uh, presentations and about the situation of hepatitis throughout the world during uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and how uh, all the countries have tried to face the challenges uh, regarding access to care for, for patients with hepatitis problems um, in the era of um, COVID-19. So uh, next slide, please. And there is, we have also implemented during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, what we call the EASO quiz, uh, which was a test to test uh, the guide, your, your guidelines knowledge. And here is an example of uh, one of the quizzes. Um, can you click please? And so you see here the easel quiz. So that's that's where you can find the quiz when you go on the easel uh, campus uh, webpage. Uh, next one, please. And here you have, for example, one of the quiz. So you see that there is a question. And for example, here you have a 58 year old man uh, which presents with a bilateral shoulder pain. And then we ask you about uh, the etiology. And if you click, um, you can click now. So you have the you have the answer, and then you have the comment. So you can really improve your knowledge, and and um, and maybe for some of you who could not work, and especially the young doctors who could not work uh, because of uh, of the lockdown, uh, then you can review your knowledge and and still uh, stay on top um, on top of uh, of your training. And you can click now, and it's. All the quizzes are related to uh, the clinical practice guidelines. And this one, for example, was related to the clinical practice guidelines for hepatitis C virus infection. Uh, next one, please. And of course, we did not forget the patients, and that's very important because during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of patients could not have access to health care in most hospitals because a lot of hospitals were completely turned uh, towards the COVID-19 uh, care. So uh, we, we were really dedicated to offer patient-oriented educational uh, offer to patients. And can you click, please? And for example, the next one, please. Uh, you see that there was a patient-oriented webcast on the COVID-19 and the liver, so to provide knowledge on COVID-19 to the patients. And you see here that the patient could have access to a special page regarding the care of patients with liver disease during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, uh, because we could not have a face-to-face -face, um, international liver Congress uh, in April, as it was planned, we decided to go digital. And you have here the web link to the digital format of the, I, um, of the ILC 2020, which will be held in August. So I really uh, invite you to apply um, and, and register uh, now, so you are sure to get all the latest information on, uh, on hepatology and the main challenges of hepatologies around the world. Um, end of August. And that's uh, my last slide. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, fantastic talk and the uh, absolutely new model of education, uh, which I think will be continue for some time due to this COVID pandemic, but maybe it will be also the way we can communicate in the future with many people uh, who cannot attend uh, the meetings. Uh, so uh, again, uh, I would like to thank uh, all uh, three speakers for fantastic talks, and we are now uh, moving to the question and answers. So I encourage you to ask the question either uh, by raising their, uh, your hand via the button uh, available to, uh, on the go to the webinar control panel, or you can send a question. I have already a few questions, so uh, I think we can start uh, from uh, a question to uh, Luca. 
So uh, the question to Luca is, uh, um, Luca, what is the reason uh, for low mortality in the recipient on tacrolimus? This is a question from uh, Dr. Reddy uh, de la Pa. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, it, it was a bit of a surprise also for us because we didn't expect much difference between uh, tacrolimus and cyclosporin, to be honest. So the first thing we did is just to check whether other, our colleagues, our kidney colleagues uh, observe a similar uh, uh, um, findings in their uh, services. Unfortunately, there is no large report on kidney recipients uh, uh, that report this specific, uh, that cover this specific issue. <clears throat> Perhaps uh, they are on preparation, but for the time being, this information is not available. So the second step, I we also check on the literature whether there were some association between the use of tacrolimus and uh, these uh, uh, SARS-CoV uh, uh, infections, and uh, it was a surprise that there is some association. <laughs> I, we found some reports uh, uh, which go back to some uh, publication uh, published five, uh, between five and seven years ago, reporting an, an effect of tacrolimus, but not only of tacrolimus, I would say, also of uh, uh, cyclosporin on the replication of SARS-CoV, not SARS-CoV-2. And so perhaps there is some interference with the replication of the viruses, and this is uh, all what we know <laughs> for the time being. Yeah, it would be uh, easy to say that perhaps tacrolimus is more uh, uh, potent than cyclosporin, so perhaps this may play a, a role, but as a matter of fact, we don't know yet. Okay, thank you, Luca, for uh, answering this question. And um, we will uh, now allow uh, one question from the audience. So uh, I'm going to uh, unmute uh, the first uh, um, participant who raised the question, and this is Dr. Hassan uh, Shakeban. Uh, so, uh, um, yes, please, Dr. Shakeban, go ahead with your question. Okay. We cannot hear him. Yeah. Maybe he should unmute himself. Wait, Jake. Uh, this is Miguel here. I can see that uh, Dr. Shakaban has is not currently on this window, so I think we should go to another question. Maybe okay. Karine Van May or Marcelo Silva. I can see that they're both still on this window, so that they may okay. be. Okay. So then uh, we are moving to uh, the next participant, Marcelo Silva. Uh, hello. Uh, please uh, um, go ahead and ask your question. We unmuted you. Good afternoon, everybody. Very, very nice presentation. I'm, I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Luca, the question is for you. Have you seen any, any specific different cause of death among the liver transplanted patients besides just the, the lung disease or the respiratory failure of these patients? Was the liver at any point a cause of death? No. <laughs> This is a crucial uh, question. I, uh, the vast majority of patients died of respiratory failure. So mm -hmm. I would say more than 80% of them. Then we had some cases of uh, um, uh, pulmonary embolism, some hemorrhages uh, and stuff like that, or someone died for uh, metastatic uh, uh, cancers, but the vast majority died of uh, respiratory failure. Okay. We uh, can I yes, John? Yeah, we have observed um, in a live donor liver transplant case before we did testing, the mother was COVID positive, and the baby developed a a, a COVID hepatitis, which uh, has a very particular appearance with. Uh, multiple necrotic hepatocytes, the, the pathologist described it as crumbling liver. 
uh, fortunately, it resolved. In the, uh, in the overall population at Columbia, nearly all of the autopsy patients, non-transplant, had uh, some degree of hepatitis in the, uh, in the patients who died, although I think the primary cause of deaths were pulmonary. Okay, thank you for this comment. And I have a question to you, uh, uh, Jean. The question from Luis Carlos Rodriguez from Mexico. And uh, the question is, did you have any knowledge of uh, transmitted uh, COVID-19 from cadaveric donor to the recipient? We, we had no experience with this. Um, the, uh, the transplant community was very cautious about accepting livers. And so everybody who was transplanted uh, was coming from donors who had been tested multiple times for the, um, for the PCR test. So we did not observe uh, a, a deceased donor transmission, and I'm not aware of any, although I'm sure there have been some. Our transmission was in a living donor who was not tested in the beginning of March. At least from our survey in Europe, we also haven't received any positive confirmation of uh, donor transmitted COVID-19 into the recipient, at least from the uh, uh, deceased donors. So let's move to another question from the audience. And I think, uh, uh, and help me, uh, Miguel, Karin Lamay, Lamay uh, I will uh, unmute her. And uh, please uh, go ahead with your question, uh, Karin. We can't hear her. Karin, if you're listening. Karin. Maybe someone else then. Okay, can you pick up the, you see probably a little bit. Uh, I have Janos Pasakas. Janos, are you there? Would you like to ask a question? You're unmuted, Janos. Nope. Nope. Okay, so... Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, mean, I mean, sorry. Uh, thank you so much for the great presentation. My uh, question is about the thrombo thromboembolic complication in COVID-19 patients. It is very common in the non-transplant field. What had you observed in your experience in all transplanted patients or your transplanted patients? This is my first question. And the second question is about the secondary infection or mixed infection. They are more common in the immunosuppressed patients compared to the non-transplant patients. What, what is your opinion? What did you observe? Thank you so much. So if I can start, uh, certainly we learned that the uh, thrombotic complications were a major problem uh, after, after a while, I would say. So in, in the beginning, unfortunately for the registry, we didn't uh, ask a specific question regarding the uh, uh, thrombotic complication. Nevertheless, uh, some patient died from uh, a severe thrombotic complication. So this is a major problem. And uh, uh, I would say that the majority of the centers, uh, uh, particularly more recently, started using a prophylaxis and more than 80% of the cases reported in the registry were on, uh, um, in, on uh, heparin prophylaxis. So this is the only information we can get from the registry. Perhaps it underestimate the, uh, uh, perhaps certainly it underestimate the, uh, the, uh, the relevance of this dramatic complication. Okay, uh, I have a next question from- I, I uh, could, uh... Oh, sorry. I would sorry, like to please. comment. We, we had a very high incidence of superinfection with uh, gram negative bacteria 
frequent loyalty resistant gram negatives in the both the transplant and the uh, non-transplant patients. Okay. I think we have a, one important question uh, from the audience, from uh, Krzysztof Zieniewicz from Poland. Uh, we expect probably next peak of COVID uh, in autumn. Could we, the transplant community, prepare to it? And if, what are the most important measures? I think the question is to all of uh, us. So, Karin, maybe you can uh, at least yes, try to sure. answer this question. Yes, so definitely. So we are um, we are not really reassured regarding uh, the fact that we're going to have a second wave or not, in, especially in, in Europe. Um, I have to say that it's very, very important to implement all the measures to make a barrier to the virus and especially uh, to, to, to tell the patients to wear a mask uh, when they go in a in a closed area uh, where there are a lot of people gathering, especially shops, for example, or other, you know, cultural places, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it's not because there is a very few cases like it is right now in France, for example, that the virus is not circulating anymore. So implementing those barriers like wearing masks and and uh, washing hands um, with um, with alcoholic solution. It's very, very important. So I think that to prevent the second wave, um, that's that very simple measures to implement. And uh, as, a, as the doctors, we should really educate our patients by wearing a mask ourselves when we are, uh, especially at hospital or in the, in the closed areas. Luca, any comment uh, on this? I have nothing much to add on. I just only want to remind that we are still in the middle of the pandemic. You know, we, yesterday we had more than 50 or 100,000 cases uh, all over the world. So we are, we, we should be very worried about some cases coming from the outside. So I'm pretty, pretty much concerned about what will happen in, uh, in, uh, in autumn and in, in winter. Of course, nothing to add to what Karina has already said. Now, what is the uh, uh, expectation in, in the United States? How to deal well, with the second the United, wave? Yeah, in the United States, we have finished the first wave in New York and the Northeast, but a number of our states refused to implement public health measures until now. And so now we are seeing a, an enormous peak of the first wave in Florida, Texas, Arizona, and some other parts of the country. This is uh, disappointing. In the beginning of our first wave, we had very limited testing, and uh, the, we had a 50% positive test rate in the hospital in the first month. Um, in New York now, the uh, positive test rate overall is about 1%. And the virus is circulating, probably like Italy and France, the virus is circulating in the population, but at a very low rate. In, in our hospital, we still have about 60 patients, inpatients with COVID, meaning uh, about maybe 7% of the hospital beds. So we, we have entered a endemic phase of the virus and hopefully rapid early testing and aggressive public health measures will limit the severity of the second phase. I, I really hope that's true, but public health measures are the most important. Yeah, totally agree. <laughs> So well, let's try another uh, uh, attendees. Uh, I have a question uh, or rising hand from Dr. Vela Gala. Uh, I will try to unmute you. And uh, Dr. Vela Gala, you are uh, unmuted. Uh, please go on with your question. Yeah, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am from uh, India. Uh, my question is, uh, after uh, after the patient diagnosed with the COVID, a liver transplant recipient, do you continue tacrolimus or will you change the immunosuppression to steroids? What was the protocol? Is there What is the protocol in, in your institute, sir? Uh, 
Luca, from from I, European experience. Yes, can you just? I didn't understand the question. I apologize. So you just can you just Could summarize? You go on? Yeah, do you go on with immunosuppressive therapy and especially uh, uh, steroids um, in a patient who has uh, COVID-19 and with a transplantation, liver, uh, liver transplanted? Or do you stop the treatment, the immunosuppressive treatment? Oh, I, can't, I'm sorry. I, I can't understand. Oh. Look, look uh, at there. There were several questions about the modification immunosuppression, immunosuppression. Oh, I see. in, in the liver transplant uh, recipient oh, when they have COVID nineteen. So, can you comment on this? Yes, sorry. So, this specific issue was investigated also in the in the registry, and we tried. To, there are two issues. So, first, we try to understand whether the uh, level of immunosuppression. Uh, at the baseline, let's say before the COVID disease had any impact on the outcome of the disease. And we arbitrarily stratified patients according to the level of tacrolimus or, or cyclosporin. And we couldn't see any effect whatsoever. Then there is the, the, the management of immunosuppression in uh, a patient with COVID-19. And I would say it's, it's difficult to understand what is useful to do because everybody behaved in a different way. And this is a registry. And uh, um, I, in, in general, I would say, in general, of course, patients receiving drugs that have a, a, lot, a strong interference with uh, CNI, like uh, uh, lopinavir, of course, they have a dramatic withdrawal or reduction of the dose. But in, in general, the, the uh, clinician try to remove the uh, secondary drugs or reduce the secondary drugs. And in, in some instances, they, they, they withdrew also the main immunosuppressant, perhaps because they added other immunosuppressants such as uh, the IDOS uh, steroids. And, but there is, it's difficult to understand what is the best, uh, the best way to go and which uh, advice to give in, 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 in practice. So it's just a mixture of different attitudes, I would say. But certainly the, immune, the level of immunosuppression at the very beginning doesn't seem to play a, a, a relevant role. But only the use of FK rather than the use of uh, uh, um, cyclosporin or uh, uh, mTOR. Uh, Jean of Karin, any comment on this? Any experience with this? Yeah, I, well, I, I agree. We did not see an effect. We found... Um, Patients many years after transplant on low dose tacro monotherapy had equally severe cases as early transplant. So I, I agree with that observation. The general uh, approach to lowering immunosuppression is probably reasonable. There's some old data from the MERS uh, infections that. Uh, mycophenolate might, at a low dose, might even be beneficial, but we did not observe this in our practice. As far as steroids, um, we had uh, really no benefit from tocilizumab in our patients once they became sick. Uh, probably equal benefit from slight increase in steroids during the acute phase of the uh, pulmonary disease. Uh, and of, of course, we gave remdesivir to some of the patients with uh, uh, not a clearly discernible uh, effect. And unfortunately, remdesivir can't be used in the presence of severe liver injury. So that's another uh, uh, obstacle. Yeah, definitely. That's very yeah. important. Yeah, we, we, we treated a few patients with tocilizumab and we had a pretty good uh, response to treatment and, especially, and also when we increased um, the dosing of uh, steroids as well in pulmonary form of the disease in patients who, had, who were at this cytokinic storm stage. Okay. The, there are the, a few questions. The transplant, oh, sorry, sorry. Had, the transplant patients had consistently very high uh, anti-inflammatory markers. Would you agree, Karine? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. 
And the question is also from the audience, several questions uh, uh, about the living donor liver transplantation and deceased donor liver transplantation. And the questions are mostly, do we see any differences uh, between in the, in the outcome of the COVID-19 uh, uh, between the uh, living donor uh, liver transplant patient and deceased uh, liver recipient, of liver recipient of deceased livers? Do you have any, any information, Luca, on this from our registry? No, not very many cases, I would say. Yeah, and uh, Jean? Any any reports from the United States? No, we we don't know. We don't know. I think we, we still don't have this this information, unfortunately. Mm. Okay, uh, it's it's a time uh, to uh, wrap up uh, this uh, wonderful webinar, um, and uh, unfortunately, we cannot uh, ask all questions. There is a bunch of questions still. Mm pending but we have to stick to the time so uh, well today we have learned uh, that in liver recipients with COVID-19 the early mortality is around 20 percent uh, and the risk independent risk factors for uh, mortality is age above 70 and the use of uh, cyclosporine uh, uh, or mTOR inhibitors and of course, we have to remember that uh, additional risk factors are comorbidity, especially diabetes mellitus and chronic uh, liver failure, um, and they are really uh, relevant predictors for the mortality. From from talk uh, from Jean, uh, we we have learned that uh, uh, although it was feared about the mortality, uh, increased mortality in in, in uh, liver transplant setting, uh, uh, it's more or less similar to the general population and we have a lot of questions unresolved about the immunocompetence, uh, immunosuppressive management and also viral responses. And finally, well, uh, Karin showed us how to change, uh, how to reshape our education uh, mode in, uh, in the COVID uh, pandemic. I hope we will go back to face-to-face -to -face <laughs> meeting at some point because that that gives us a lot of interactions. I miss them very much, but uh, for time being, I think the only option is, is really uh, virtual uh, education, virtual meetings. Um, so um, on behalf of ESOT and ELITA, I would like to thank, first of all, uh, our three speakers and our uh, audience, very active audience, for participating tonight. And um, I again, I invite you all to visit um, uh, our website, edu.esotransplantlife.org. Uh, this uh, webinar will be recording and will be available in the few days on COVID-19 forum. Uh, I again remind you about the, our three, uh, three society uh, joint project on the survey uh, um, to assess the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, which, be, which will be launched soon. And uh, next slide, please. And I invite you also uh, to join the next uh, ESOT webinar, this time uh, organized together with a biotest uh, on uh, HBV uh, prophylaxis in liver transplant recipients. Thank you very much for participation, uh, and I wish you a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.